Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today on the role of remijapant in the acute treatment of migraine. This is an overview of what we'll be talking about. We'll first be talking briefly about the role of CGRP and GPANTS in migraine in general. We'll then be talking about the design of the remijapant clinical trials program the results of that program with an emphasis on the orally dissolvable tablet formulation. And then I'll close with some comments on safety, tolerability, and long-term safety of remijapan. As you're all aware, there are unmet needs in the acute treatment of migraine. For one thing, not everyone has an adequate response to currently available therapies, and the triptans were certainly a breakthrough in migraine therapeutics. Up to 55% of people don't have sufficient relief with available treatments. Not everyone can tolerate triptans and the other standard current treatments. One of the problems with triptans in particular is recurrence and depending on the drug, between 17 and 40% of people take a trip 10, have their headache relieved, and then the headache returns. You're all aware that trip 10s contain within label cardiovascular contraindications. And then finally, trip 10s can cause medication overuse headache as can other acute treatments. When we look at the evidence linking CGRP to migraine, let's begin with a brief review of CGRP. So, we know that CGRP is a neuropeptide released by the trigeminal nerve during migraine attacks. We know that selective binding of the CGRP receptor by antagonists, including GPANTS and monoclonal, certain monoclonal antibodies can take place without causing the vasoconstrictive effects of triptans. And we believe that CGRP mechanisms are not associated with the medication overuse potential that we see with many other acute treatments. If we look at the basic anatomy, you can see that CGRP is released at both ends of the trigeminal nerve, which is a pseudobipolar nerve, and that CGRP is released during migraine attacks. And we know that, or believe at least, that the CGRP mechanism of action, again, is not associated with risk of medication overuse. There are abundant reasons, some of which we've talked about already, for thinking that CGRP plays a crucial role in migraine. It's located in the regions appropriate to our understanding of migraine pathophysiology. We know, and we've known for a long time from Godsby and Edvinson's work, that CGRP levels rise in plasma during migraine attacks. We know that CGRP levels fall after a triptan is administered as headaches are relieved. We know that CGRP can trigger a migraine attack. And finally, the benefits of specific CGRP-targeted therapies provides another line of evidence indicating that this is an important mechanism in migraine. Why develop CGRP small molecule receptor antagonists um, in a world where we already have monoclonal antibodies? Well, for one, th and for one thing, the monoclonal antibodies are largely used as preventive treatments and the CGRP small molecule receptor blockers at the moment are largely used as acute treatments. It is the case that intravenous administration of monoclonal antibodies has, have a preventive effect. It's also the case that chronic administration of GPANTS have benefits on the prevention side. In the context of acute treatment, um, of course, GPANTS 
provide a mechanism completely distinct from the mechanism of tryptans. And based on that, we might hope that they'll be useful in tryptan non-responders. The lack of vasoconstriction and the lack of labeling that restricts use in people who've had cardiovascular events or procedures or people at high risk for cardiovascular events means that GPANs can be used in people who have the cardiovascular contraindications of tryptans. Um, the long half-life of remigipant in particular may translate into a long duration of action. And there is at least a theoretical belief that receptor antagonism is less likely to cause medication overuse than the receptor agonists that we usually use. So sort of the bottom line is GPNs provide novel treatment strategies. In terms of the clinical trials program, um, there are two major published papers on acute treatment of migraine, one that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine that evaluated a tablet, the other that was published in Lancet that focused on an orally dissolvable tablet. There's actually a third tablet study which is soon to be published in full form, which is very similar in result to the New England Journal paper. So across these phase three studies and the one-year safety program, over 3,000 patients were treated with remigipant and over 113,000 remigipant doses were delivered in the context of the phase three program. And of course, now that it's a marketed drug in the US, far more people have treated with it. So this is the design of the study. It's a phase three clinic, the, the study, the ODT study, the Lancet publication that I'm gonna be focusing on because it's the OTT formulation that is currently marketed in the US and other places. So the study is a phase three clinical trial of remigipan to ODT. Patients with stable cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk factors were permitted to participate in the study. Patients were given one dose to take during an attack while pain was moderate or severe in intensity. They recorded the results of treatment. The study's two co-primary endpoints as recommended by FDA guidance were pain freedom at two hours and freedom from the most bothersome symptom. And then following the treated attack, there was an end of study visit. The inclusion and exclusion criteria were quite typical. I'll point out that in this ODT study, people had to have ICHD migraine for a year. They had to have two to eight moderate or severe migraine attacks per month over the last three months prior to the study. The attacks had to be of typical duration. Chronic migraine was excluded from this study. And although patients on preventive meds were allowed to enroll, they had to be on stable doses for at least three months. People were excluded if they had a medical condition that might interfere with the assessment of safety or efficacy. And they were excluded if they had other neurologic disorders, uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, or unstable or recently diagnosed cardiovascular disease. So this is the way the pain assessment work, worked. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. At baseline, people rated their pain on a four-point scale as non-mild, moderate, or severe. In order to treat attacks, they had to report moderate or severe pain. Then following, treat, following treatment at two hours, they rated pain again and at other time points as well. The way most bothersome symptom works is that at the time of treatment, before taking treatment, patients were asked to designate which of these symptoms, nausea, phonophobia, or photophobia was most bothersome. That became the 
per protocol co-primary endpoint. And then they told us what their symptom status was afterwards. Of course, pain relief is the transition from moderate or severe pain to no pain or mild pain. Two hours later and pain freedom means the pain goes from moderate or severe pain to no pain at all. So the baseline characteristics of this study um, were quite typical, mean age 40, 85% um, of participants were women. The mean duration of untreated attacks was 29 hours. The historically designated most bothersome symptom had photophobia first, nausea second, and phonophobia third. And this is the pattern that we typically see in acute treatment trials that use most bothersome symptom. 14% were on a concurrent preventive med. A third had discontinued one or more triptans. And 28% were using a triptan at the time of study enrollment. So this is a population where the majority of people had triptan experience. Focusing on the results, overall the study was successful in terms of both of its co-primary endpoints. And in fact, here the 303 study is the ODT formulation. And what we see is a two hours post-treatment, 21% of Remigipan treated patients and 10.9% of placebo-treated patients achieved pain freedom. A little more than a third of patients achieved pain freedom with active drug in this study, and about a quarter of patients achieved pain freedom in the placebo group. And then you can see looking at the 301 and 302 studies, which were the two tablet studies that results were quite similar. This graphically displays the results of the ODT study. I'll point out as the slide highlights that in this study, people were only allowed one dose um, <clears throat> of active drug, though they were allowed to rescue at two hours. These data represent results prior to rescue medication. Um, a secondary endpoint in the study was pain relief. And here we see that remitropan treated patients achieved pain relief in 59% of cases compared to 43% of cases for placebo treated patients. Now, looking across the time span, we, we see the 90 minute data, which was statistically significant for pain freedom. And we see that the proportion of people who achieved pain freedom increased across the observation period following treatment, hitting nearly 50% at six hours and 56% at eight hours. And we see that statistically significant differences were maintained. And I'll point out that this is an analysis where if you took rescue medication, um, those results aren't included in the post two hour time points. And so we see that the development of treatment effects continues to emerge past the two hour primary endpoint time. Now we're looking at the pain relief data. Um, you know, pain relief from my perspective is a very important endpoint because when people achieve pain relief, they often make the transition from having disability to not being disabled. And on pain relief, there's statistically significant, well, there, there is, I'm sorry, numerically significant separation at 15 minutes and statistically significant separation um, at all time points thereafter. Three quarters of patients achieved um, pain relief by six hours and 77% of 24 hours. And the pain relief benefits were sustained after 48 hours. 
which is not surprising given the 11 hour half-life of the drug. So now we're looking at return to normal function and you see that people experience return to normal function at a higher rate than they experience pain freedom. And that again is why I think the pain relief endpoint though not a primary endpoint is highly clinically informative. And so you see at two hours, 38% of people were able to work and function normally and that differences were on, on, on um, restoration of function became statistically significant at one hour. And again, that benefits were sustained through 48 hours. Now here we're looking at the Kaplan-Meier curves that tell us about um, use of rescue medication. The green line represents placebo, the blue line, remigipant, and you see rates of rescue medication were quite low in remigipant treated patients, less than 15% took rescue medication over 24 hours, and that rescue rate, rates were substantially higher in the placebo treated patients. So, so again, because the study design didn't allow redosing with remigipant, we're looking at the efficacy that was achieved with a single dose of the orally dissolvable tablet. And 86% of patients who treated with remigipant didn't use a rescue medication over 24 hours. This next slide um, summarizes results across a broad range of the 21 consecutively tested hierarchical endpoints. And on this sort of plot, the points represent um, the difference between NERTEC response and placebo response. And if the confidence intervals don't include zero, that means the result is statistically significant. So here again, you see that on a broad array of endpoints, looking at function, looking at time points past two hours, that the ODT product achieves statistical significance. And I'll point out when you do this sort of hierarchical analysis, the way it works is you specify the order in which you're going to test your endpoints. And as long as you keep achieving statistical significance, you get to keep testing. And once you fail to separate from placebo, then any statistical test you do is nominal. And the purpose of this is to guard against capitalizing on chance. But in the case of this study with 21 consecutive endpoints being positive, that is not a result attributable to chance. So this summarizes the efficacy result with pain relief that was statistically significant at 60 minutes, return to normal function significant at 60 minutes, and pain freedom and freedom from most bothersome sy symptom statistically significant at 90 minutes. This slide also illustrates separation on the per protocol primary endpoints and demonstrate that benefits once achieved were sustained for 24 and 48 hours. So in terms of safety and tolerability, um, remigipant was very well tolerated. The most common adverse event in the placebo control trial was nausea. That occurred in 2% of remigipant treated patients and 0.4% of placebo treated patients. Safety and tolerability profiles were maintained in a subsequent long-term open label study where patients took remigipant over 52 weeks. So this is more detail on the safety profile. Um, we've talked about nausea already. The next most common adverse event were urinary tract infections. There were no treatment-related increases in transaminase levels above three times the upper limit of normal. 
um, one remitropan treated patient and one placebo treated patient did have transaminase elevations that exceeded that threshold, but neither was assessed by the principal investigator to be related to study medication and no subject experienced a doubling of bilirubin. So the safety profile was quite clean as is summarized on this slide. So a summary of the profile is that this study shows that remijapan was effective on its co-primary endpoints and on multiple other endpoints that it demonstrated a sustained effect in the acute, acute treatment of migraine as well. The ODT formulation um, is certainly convenient for people to take. Um, my impression clinically is that people like it, um, that um, the benefits are durable and that the drug was well tolerated. In terms of the long-term safety studies, there's a screening and baseline phase. And then people were provided with remijapan for up to a year. They were provided with enough medication so that they could take it every day. Though based on the actual pattern of use in the study, the label says that safety for treating more than 15 migraines in a 30 day period hasn't been established. There's subsequently been studies that show that remijapan, when taken every other day, is beneficial in the preventive treatment of migraine. In those studies, there was no safety signal either. So in the long-term safety study, there were nearly 1,800 subjects exposed to more than 111,000 doses for up to 52 weeks. Only 2.7% of subjects discontinued treatment due to an adverse event. And the favorable safety profile was maintained throughout this long-term safety study. So here we're summarizing overall adverse events <clears throat> from the, from the long-term safety study. And what we see is that overall adverse event rates were um, occurred in 60% of people, but adverse events leading to discontinuation occurred in less than 3% of people. And then when we look at the adverse event rates that occurred in more than 2% of people, they include UTIs, nasopharyngitis. We see nausea again, you know, three quarters of the way down the slide. We see dizziness at low rates in the, you know, in the um, one to two percent range. So Remijapan certainly offers the convenience of a 75 milligram single dose for adults. It is the only CGRP receptor antagonist available in a rapidly disintegrating formulation, although Ubrojapan is available in the US at least as an orally swallowed tablet. An advantage of the ODT formulation is people can take it without water. My belief is that these drugs work better if you take them early and the attack while pain is still mild and not needing a glass of water may make it easy to take while driving in a car while in a meeting or whatever. The studies did include people taking preventive medication and there was no evidence for greater AEs when taken with preventive medication versus without. It can be administered with oral contraceptives and antidepressants and there is no contraindication for people with stable cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular risk factors. So remijapan does provide an opportunity to address some of those unmet needs that we began with. The product, because of its OD formula, ODT formulation, um, 
dissolves quickly and can start working relatively quickly. The long half-life of 11 hours may account for the benefits that I showed you at 24 and 48 hours, and it's relatively simple to use. And, you know, having been able to use Rumijapant in practice, I do find that it is an important option for patients with migraine. And with that, I would like to wish you a very enjoyable meeting and thank you for your attention.